have to educate yourself on the tradition of what people have used over the years. Uh, you have to know how to look for the storyline when you don't have lyrics to just hand all that information to you. And these things all come into play so that you're ready when you step into the studio to make music. The changes are going to be made in the studio. If your client's not making them or your composer's not making them, you will be making them. So don't worry about changes because if you do, you will get stuck. Trust yourself because your client, your producer, your composer, you have nothing to prove because they've all deemed you qualified to be on that podium conducting. Everybody's got their own way of getting notes on a page, and everybody's got their own way of getting there. My name's Harlan Hodges, and this is how I do it. You never want to step on the composer's toes, and you have to know what to look for. And you're going to be dealing with melodies, instrumentation, voicings, and storyline. When your melodies come into play, you've got to look at the stylistic way in which the composer, the artist, phrases and where he accents things and his long line. So you want to interpret those and use them and build off of them when you're writing your own melodies. Generally, the instrumentation they hand you, you don't get to choose. So you want to find how you can most effectively use that instrumentation to enhance the melodies. The storyline you may not have talked about previously, so you have to essentially make up your own storyline that you hope mimics what the composer's intent was. And finally, with your voicings on a more technical side, a composer will generally hand you structures in their voicings that you have to understand how to fill out, how to create space, how to add to the texture in whatever way uh, might be necessary to get the piece across the finish line. Yeah, it might be kind of fun if we went 116, 117 to go dun 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 and then in 118, 119 would be just to build that, you know, sure. try that. One of the key factors in uh, music making is the question, will I be heard? And as a orchestrator, one of those ways you can guarantee you're going to be heard is if you put a lot of people on one note, a unison or an octave. Collectively, you stick that many people on that kind of structure and it's gonna poke through the texture. When it comes to voicings, a lot of times when you write a triad even, you may have this close voicing thing um, going on, but one of the techniques I use a lot of is drop two, which creates a little bit open space uh, where there may be a melody you're trying not to rub up against or blur or create any kind of confusion about what's supposed to come through the texture at that particular moment. Because when I take that structure and move the second voice from the top down an octave, it creates a totally new open light texture for the melody to shine through. That be uh, uh, um, yeah, and I think too, hey Brooks, we might like thin it out too. Let's do it with the whole ensemble, but I want to see how it might sound with fewer people on it. Okay, let's do that one more time. Ready? So when I heard Anthem for the first time and I heard this melody, uh, it immediately evoked in my mind this Western scene where I saw this landscape and I saw these open, open canyons and maybe horseback riding. And I, a lot of the, this imagery came to mind. And so I thought, well, 
maybe riding like these horse hooves moving. So that became the that became the arrangement, the line. Funny enough, when I spoke to Jeff later about this, uh, we had the same scene in our heads. And that goes to your don't ask, don't tell policy. Jeff never told me that story. It was in the music. So right off the bat, you have this fanfare happening with the band. And so what we're doing is we're taking these melodic fragments uh, that are happening in the band and doubling them with obviously the viola here. The violins are on that high tremolo just creating excitement and trying to enhance the grandiose nature of this fanfare right before we kick off into this rhythmic section here. Now watch the basses and cellos. So they're just doubled in octaves. Everybody on a tremolo? Unison. No problem. Here come the violins in unison. There's the galloping horses. Basses and cellos just doubling in that octave. Rhythmically punching everything, creating excitement. You are being heard. You're sticking through the texture. You're not doing anything fancy. You're just finding an exciting line, just like here. Uh, right, nothing too hard in the writing, just simple melody, simple idea. Now we're rhythmically building a ostinato off a few rhythms. Everything is unisons and octaves here. A little drop too right here. Now watch. Mm, everything sails in the octave. Violins, violas, octaves. Rhythmic punching, cellos and basses. Now watch. Triple octaves here. Mm. Cellos have joined in in that triple octave. And we're on the melody. We're not doing anything. Nothing's hidden. A little bit of a relaxed moment here. Saxophone takes us. Now watch, we punch that excitement. Mixed articulations to enhance that drama. The unisons and the high violins are half tremolo. When you're talking about storyline, one of the funniest things that happened when we were writing um, Anthem and I was arranging was when it came to this horseback riding thing that we kind of came on months after it was written is this, you know, what, and then they take off and do this big thing. And this almost like flying melody. I was thinking these people are kind of on this horseback riding and then they open up and we just see this giant southwestern landscape where it's just beautiful and grand. And immediately in my mind I thought of the E.T. theme. So what makes that melody so special is the orchestration. When Williams, there's something he knew, talk about educating yourself about what works. That melody is in octaves. And the highest part of the violin. I mean, it just totally grabs your heartstrings and makes you feel like you're actually there flying. Tchaikovsky did it in the love scene from Romeo and Juliet. Romeo and Juliet. Uh, just, ah, there's something about that in the high violins. And so that worked for us, you know, when we came around on that melody for the second time. Right in the exact same range. To evoke that, that same feeling of just grand kind of flying or almost weightless feeling. And so it's funny that we both had come to that conclusion only months after did we find out that we kind of had a similar dialogue in our head.
So your solo is over and you're going to bring back your main theme one last time. How are you going to reconnect the story? You're going to look for motifs. You're going to look for melodic fragments that you know are important. The main theme is inevitably going to come in and you're going to have to find a way to enhance that. In Anthem, the way we enhanced that was we said this needs to be voiced out. And we drew on other influences in the past like John Williams in his E.T. theme, this flying kind of idea. And then we look at Ravel and how he voiced out these thick textures and lines. And we said, okay, that's the answer. Because we've already gone through these other iterations of the theme. How do we make this last time stand out? So the final iteration of that theme we voiced in a drop two block chord melody with the strings as the saxophone is playing along. And then... So that we don't overkill, we find these other ways of saying, okay, we've used motor rhythms in the past. Let's really build the excitement by getting the violins high, as high as they can go, executing a motor rhythm. And when you're in that thin part of the instrument and when you're using strings, they're not percussion instruments. So you've got to find a way, you take a look at a rhythm and you have to figure out how to break that up because they don't. Ha they have a different attack. They have a different mechanics of how they're going to get through. So we have the violins doing this that ba 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 those interior rhythms break it between your groups. Have one group ba 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 while the other group is so that the end result is so breaking up your motor rhythms is an excellent way to enhance what's going on rhythmically and presenting those motifs in new ways. So we have to ask ourselves what's important and that's the main theme. So we build into it, we've reused a fragment of this final iteration and now it's fully harmonized. And a drop two, just like Ravel. And then you take things like John Williams E.T., you know how he uses the octaves there, cellos, violas, he knows how to utilize those voicings and utilize those things to give the theme importance, creating motor rhythms that enhance the drama, it shows excitement, it shows that we've gone somewhere. It's a glorious thing that we're reiterating this theme for the final time. Awesome. <laughs> when you're writing, you're often confronted with the idea of, is this good? Is this bad? Am I going on the right path? I think outside of that gut intuition, you have to kind of be tuned to the same frequency that your composer is tuned to. So if they're handling a melody a certain way, you're going to have to handle the melody in a very similar way. You're going to have to find those things that they naturally do, the thing that's a part of their craft, the thing that's a part of their artistry. You're going to have to find ways to grasp those concepts internally and put those concepts into your writing so that it doesn't feel disconnected. It doesn't feel like two composers. It feels like one composer. And then the arranger comes in and you have to be the same voice as your artist. You can't let them down by following your own intuition blindly. The biggest thing is ask yourself, is this a good idea or is this a bad idea? And if your radio is tuned to the same frequency as the artist, you're going to know how to pick an idea, build a climax, transfer those ideas between the voices, find a motor rhythm, whatever it is, that you guys can all climb to that same place together. And finally, you got to stick your landing. Tremolos. Sforzando.
We're letting the audience know something has happened. The spaceship has left orbit. We're seeing the final tail as it goes out of sight. And then we're letting the fairy dust settle. And that's one thing that I've always been excited about Jeff's music is that he definitely has that particular quality. And that's how we made this arrangement work. One of those things you have to pay attention to with each composer you work with or each client you work with is what are the recurring ideas that they may be using uh, as a device in their own music. In Jeff's case, we kind of talk about this continuous climb that everybody's making together. Everybody's pushing forward to that moment. So keeping that in mind, you have to arrange material over 10 minutes rather than three minutes, like a regular song. So you have to find those things that recur, the melodies, the motifs, and find ways of treating them to represent that continuous forward motion as an ensemble, as a group, all kind of climbing that mountain together. So one of the ways I handle that is I find an idea that I think can work and I stick to it and I'll reuse it, I won't throw it away. I'll find that idea and I'll build it slowly and I'll massage that material to the point where I know I'm going to have, here's my big moment. Here's my climax of where we're all going to be in that, share that musical moment together. And so I'll take that idea and if it's in the violins, the next time it comes around, I might hand it to the violas or cellos so that I'm not beating the same idea up in the same group the same way each time. I might reharmonize that idea. I might find a different voicing. Uh, it goes back to these main, these main groups, your melodies, your voicings, your instrumentation, and your story. But you find ways that you vary those ideas with these very common devices, changing uh, voicing, changing groups of instruments, changing dynamic levels, changing articulations. And once you know you're gonna build it to that climactic moment, everything kind of has to, it's like a cog in a wheel or in a machine. Each cog is important and how they're placed together has to kind of all function in this way to bring us into that, that place where it all works. So the bass kicks us off. Everybody's in octaves, but they're transitioning to tremolo. Why? 
We're creating that energy. We're showing the listener what's important. Counter melodies, the guitar, we're, we're being clued in by the other people in the band and we're just following their lead. And then another transition to tremolo, the big payoff. Counter melody, basses and cellos, octaves, rhythmic punching everything, they're just enhancing. We're, we're now completely with the band. We're finding those things in the guitar. We're finding those things in the sax. We're finding that melody. For instance, that melody is gonna come around again. We've now heard it twice. So now watch, the final time everybody jumps on it in octaves. Quadruple octaves, the entire band states the final phrase. Ooh. And then we let you know it's over. Violins fly up. They kind of go off into the ether. Everybody else does a pits. The scene is over. So in Prudence, one of the things uh, that Jeff handed me on the lead sheet is this cool, portal with a Q, uh, voicings, that there's so much color there, it's really hard to navigate chord changes, especially those. There's so much color there, and most of that color is actually functional. So, you know, it's really hard to know how to work within that, because you have to stay a little bit vague. So using fourth or chordal voicings or quintal voicings, it's a good way to kind of weave in and out of those functional harmonies. So Jeff's lick is and that big color chord. So the way I handle that is voicing out these kind of shapes, a lot of them are already in the piano part, but finding different interesting ways to work around that, especially on chords like this. Whereas, if that's in the piano and it's fixed, a good way to navigate around that, just straight up fourths, a big fifth in the bass, so that we are complementing what the piano player is playing. He's playing that, we're playing this. beautiful, colorful palette of stewy awesomeness. So on the second phrase, we kind of migrate away from that and start doing a counter melody. So while Jeff is we're going So a combination of the fourth and fifth voicings Along with what they're already doing is a really great way to navigate really colorful passages when you don't necessarily want the functional harmony in the strings. Ask yourself, what am I hearing? What kind of voicings am I hearing? How can I enhance those? We're using chordal voicings here because the clear choice for me was I want to add a sense of air, dimension, instability, a little bit of blurred definition. So. The music that was handed to me had a very, very particular fixed idea. And the next choice is double the melody. Find those fragments, follow the clues. Try to spend time with the arrangement so that you can clearly answer where's the focus? Where am I leading? Where am I following? What am I hearing?
There's something about Holst, what he did in the secondary theme in Jupiter. There's never anything over an eighth note there. And it's one of the most transcendent musical moments in Western music. How did he do it? There's something about repeating. It's Here's what it is. It's your use of voicing. It's your use of dynamics on the build. Not letting the cat out of the bag too soon. It's saying, I've got this great thing happening. Even if it's simple. And you do it. And then when it comes back around, as a second iteration of that theme, you add dynamics. Another way of adding dynamics is add more people. Instruments add up. So add more people to the orchestration. If you're working with woodwinds and brass, the third time it comes around, hold your brass back until that moment when everybody's on it and everybody's in sync. And a build doesn't mean more notes. A transcendent moment doesn't mean more writing. It just means having the intuition to know what's necessary to really get the most clear and simple core of that idea out. So when we were talking about, um, you know, what, what influences do you draw from? All this stuff, you know, Jeff's music, I've repeatedly talked about how he has this very traditional European uh, spirit where like the meat and potatoes really is there. Um, in the classical tradition. It feels so many of these melodies are from the classical tradition. So when I heard New Guards and I knew we were repeating the same phrase over this do da da dum ba do do di da da do di di dum it just builds and builds over three huge long phrases and immediately what came to my mind yet again was going back to this Holst, like Jupiter, this middle part from, you know, looking at the score, the violins in unison with the violas in octaves, they literally... And that's the lowest note on the violin. So, you know, they get their, their strength and character on that note from the, the violas still being able to uh, you know, vibrato. Uh, it's, I mean, it just, it's this beautiful pastoral thing. And voiced out, you can take that, you know, that same line. God, it's amazing. But this stuff is just, quite simply, really well-placed quarter notes and eighth notes. And it just slowly builds into this just amazing place. The same thing happens with Jeff's music. Each time this comes around, It just continues, and I immediately thought, wow, I'm holst. So 
the clients handed you a piece of music, and this is something I like to call the client cantus firmus. Back in the day when everybody was learning how to write counterpoint, they would give a fixed melody. And then you would do these exercises where you would write note against note. Sometimes it would be in the top voice, sometimes it would be in the lower voice. So I like to call this the client canis firmus. They've handed you a fixed melody. And what do you do? You have to learn how to have that conversation with these things that you can't change. So spend time with the music. Commit it to memory. S learn it at your instrument. My particular process is I sing everything because it's the closest I can get without having a tool in front of me outside of my own body and voice. There's no, nothing holding me back from just being connected and singing that line. And then second to that, I'll move to the piano and I'll figure out what melodies I've been singing and then I'll commit them to paper. I think it's incredibly important to spend that time uh, in a very organic way, away from the technology, away from the computer, so that you are only immersed in the music, in, in the characteristics about that music that make it special. Um, and you do your best to Try to spend time with it. Try to learn the ins and outs of why something may work. That's the client Canis Firmus idea, is that these things are not going to change. It's how much time you commit to spending time with those things that won't change and discovering what about them works and what about them you wish you could change desperately, but you can't. Play the sixteenths. Uh, yes, D flat one sixteen. E flat, e flat one seventeen. D flat one eighteen. One nineteen is E flat. Uh -huh. And then uh, play the octave. Uh, when you're talking about what the client hands you, oftentimes you're not necessarily stuck, but they're going to hand you something that's challenging you or stretching you. One of those moments on Anthem was when Jeff handed me the voicings from New Guards. Actually, he handed the pianist, which then played them. But the voicings are... I mean, you have... This was the big problematic sound for me. How do you write beautiful stuff around that? It's beautiful resolution. ba dee da da that's what the melody was. So, you know, I sat with that for a long time thinking, you know, it's beautiful cantabile pastoral moment that was handed to me and then handed to the pianist and played verbatim. You have to work around that client cantus firmus, this, this thing that they've essentially locked you into and find a way to, to bring out of it what is there. So to me, the thing that stood out was this beautiful melody. Da -de -da -da. We don't even have to sing it in time. Da -da -da. Da -dee -da 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 -da. So I wanted to create a counter melody there to enhance that story, almost like, I don't know, you know, you're standing at a graveside or you're paying homage or, or something, whatever imagery. Jeff and I were both on the same wavelength there. So I started to sing this line. Do Jeff's line. Ba -da -da. Ba -da -dum, and then I rise out kind of from the underneath. So I started singing it, had it in my head, and then I sat down and started thinking, how can I get around this low end 
And so one of the things that I did was voice around this by creating just simple open voice triad. So Misha's playing this in the piano and I'm playing this. So together it all sounds like this. But it's this clustery thing when it's in the homogenous version of the piano. All the notes sound the same, but the minute you separate it and those are strings and this is piano, it's just absolutely, absolutely gorgeous. And so Jeff, do da dum, da 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 da. And all this was written at the piano, just sitting, chording, singing the lines, da da, open voice like a triad. And then these pastoral kind of. You know, it all starts here. This is. This is where it all comes together. Those moments that are particularly special or you have something to say, you absolutely, you have to sit down and get in this intimate space mm -hmm. where uh, you can find your answers because they're definitely there, but you, you have to spend the time searching. So this melody occurs multiple times it comes around in three separate iterations, one after the other. So what we're doing is we're taking that melody, we're laying back, we're holding off until the next time it comes around. We're focusing on being lyrical. We're focusing on a counter line. We're just adding one little piece to that story. Here it comes around for the second time. We're going to add a little bit more to it, a little more melodic. Taking time to create space for the melody. Now the story is continuing. And we say, we've gone on this journey how do I build this up? How do I conclude this? One of the most effective ways to do that, the high use of the violins, the beautiful, grandiose thing, that moment when it all comes together. Triple octaves, we're using violins and violas in a, in a double octave. Stating the melody one final time, all octaves. Now, here comes the most important part. We get the full ensemble playing the melody in its entirety, completely. Up to this point, we haven't done that with our ensemble. It's only been in the saxophone. So, we didn't spoil it, we didn't do it too early. We held off, we took the journey, and we say something changed, something changed in the character. Now we've arrived at a point of conclusion. The concepts, you'll find them inside of the, the literature. I mean, you have to look at literature um, constantly. I mean, all the great composers, you know, we're talking about Tchaikovsky, I'm sure Williams was looking at Tchaikovsky and then I'm looking at Tchaikovsky and Williams. We were all drawing from each other and saying, what, what's working? And you have to, that's how you, you um, that's how you give something to the composer. That's how you meet them at that place. That's how it becomes your baby. That's how it becomes the thing that you're both sharing and working forward in. Uh, that's really what, being an arranger is about. That's really what being a composer is about. Uh, whether you're lucky enough to get to arrange another person's music, you know, it's, it's such a pleasure working with great composers. But if you're a composer yourself, you have to do the exact same things. And 
sometimes it's easier to actually be locked in to what another person has kind of voiced out. That way you're literally thinking as an extension. But ultimately, I think educating yourself and finding the tradition and using the techniques because these guys didn't use computers. They sat down at their instruments or they sang.